I'm delighted to introduce John Witterick. So he is uh, one of the two out of getoutofdebtfree.org. Um, he was here on Doom Watch last night. Uh, he knows all about the fraudulent banking system, money system, and um, he's going to talk about the nature of the cage. So um, let's welcome John. Thank you. Uh, just before we start, can we just take... I do. <laughs> Hold on. Just, there we go. I have done this before. Just before we start, can I just ask us to take three deep breaths just to bring ourselves present in the room. So if you just take a deep breath in. And out. And in. And the last one. And just bring your consciousness just into your heart, and that will connect us all together for the rest of the day. And we're going to have an amazing day. What an event. Can I just have a round of applause for the guys that have organised this? Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> It feels like we're on the edge of something really, really exciting. I first woke up to all this sort of stuff back in the early 90s. And all we had, I didn't know anyone else that I could talk to this stuff, about this stuff to. And uh, all we had, can you all remember Nexus magazine? Yeah. yeah, it's still going, still going. But this is all we had back in early 90s. I suddenly came across this, uh, you know, I, I came across an old copy of Nexus magazine, and it said, is the Federal Reserve privately owned? Yeah, can you believe it? <laughs> you know, and you think how far we have come as a movement since then. This was before you could get on the internet, before you had videos, you know, we, we, a few of us had dial-up, but there was nothing on the internet at all. So, you know, we forget, sometimes we feel we're not going fast enough and we want to like, get, you know, we want to just tell everyone and wake everyone up. But I think we've got to look back and see how far we've actually come. And I know my personal journey, uh, I feel in myself, I've come an awful long way. Uh, the reason I'm getting up and talking about money isn't because I've got a degree in economics. I think that would actually... Uh, that would actually hold me back because I think that's all smoke and mirrors and actually hides what the problem is. But uh, I just ended up, like a lot of us, I ended up in debt. And I sold a business, uh, didn't get paid, and ended up in a huge amount of debt. I basically had to sort out my problem. So what I did, I basically came across uh, a lady called Mary Elizabeth Croft. And who, who's heard of her? Brilliant. Brilliant. So... Good, over half the people in the room. I mean, that's absolutely fantastic. If you haven't heard of her, get onto, uh, get onto the internet and, and look at this book. It's an amazing book. But what was happening, I'd sort of had a bit of a sort of wake up. My life had changed a lot. And it's very difficult when you're talking about spirituality to actually put it into words and explain what it is. But I'm sure a lot of us here have had a bit of a sort of wake up to what's going on and uh, feeling different in themselves. So I was looking for a way of dealing with my debts in alignment with my sort of new ideas on, you know, around myself and my relationship to the universe, for want of a better word. And uh, I came across this book and uh, how I clobbered every cash confiscatory bureau known to man. I mean, it's a remarkable book. And I thought, fantastic. This is, you know, this is it. I've got the answers. So, what I did, I got into, this was about uh, sort of 2005, something like that. And I thought, brilliant. You know, th this is amazing. So I Googled Mary Elizabeth Croft template letters, expecting thousands of, of results. There was nothing. So I thought, oh, yeah, this is going to be difficult. So what I, to, what I did, I actually reread the book twice. And the last time I read it, I made notes so that I understood the book completely and, and got where she was coming from. I then put some template letters together, and I then sent them off to the debt collectors who were, who were hounding me. And at the time, I was, 
when the debt collectors phoned up, I'd sort of say, hello, and my voice would go croaky. I'm, I'm nervous now. But when these guys phoned me up, I'd go, uh, uh. they'd say, is that John Witterett? I'd go, uh, uh. my voice would go croaky. I'd start shaking. And so, but after reading the book and sending the letters, something happened. Because when they phoned up, I was confident because I could see through the scam. And the monetary system scam is so simple that I'm sure a few of you that have seen presentations that I've done before know what I'm going to do. But I have. I did have 10 marbles. I now have six marbles. Okay? Okay, we, we, we're always... <laughs> okay. I, th I think... There could be four in the bar <laughs> last night. Okay. I have six marbles. I shall put them back in. Right. Is there anyone in the room that can get seven marbles out of this bag? Have we got any conjurers or magi or magicians? No. <laughs> There's going to be one. Every time... You think you borrow money from a bank. That's what they expect you to do. And it's impossible to get seven marbles or 11 marbles from 10 marbles. The extra marble doesn't exist. And it never does. And what happens, we're all chasing that invisible marble. And this is what's happening in the financial system. When they create money out of nothing and then expect you to pay interest on top of that, that money doesn't exist. And what it does, it creates a world where everyone hasn't quite got enough, to the point where half the world's starving. And it also creates a situation where you've got 1% of the world with over half the resources. I actually think 0.1% of, uh, of the world have actually got the majority of the wealth on the planet. It's not even 1%. It's not one person in 100. So, uh, but anyway, so what I did, once I actually came across these letters... I thought, there's a little voice in my head which it kept saying, you've got to put this on a website. And I thought, yeah, I'll do that at some point. But then it, the voice got louder and louder and louder to the point where I put up a really simple template and that was the first version of Get Out of Debt Free. It was, uh, and can anyone remember that? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic, fantastic. So, uh, yeah, not many people see that. And it sort of, I think the first, the first month, I had about five people sign up. And uh, then I got to, I started going down the local pub and doing talks on a Friday night, which was madness, because all the locals were just like filling themselves full of beer. And there was me talking about 9-11 and UFOs and stuff like that. And of course, they had a field day. And I'm still known in the village as uh, Conspiracy John. But... I then got spotted by a few people in Bournemouth who had been sort of meeting and uh, getting groups together. And then suddenly they started turning up. So when the locals started taking the piss, they'd turn around and go, shush, yeah, we're trying to hear what he's saying. And I actually started getting people taking me seriously. I then did a talk at the uh, TPUC conference, and then a lot of the truthers were aware of the website. And it got to the point in 2000 and nine. So this is still a few years ago. And uh, my mate phoned me up. He said, he said, something's going on. He said, the, uh, the figures on the website, you know, the server's almost crashed. We suddenly had an article in The Guardian by the Credit Services Association, which is the, uh, basically, they, you know, they were in a room like this, but they all had suits and ties on. And they decided there were five websites they wanted removed from the internet. And, uh, Get Out of Debt Free was one of those websites. And a Guardian reporter there wrote the story up, and we had hyperlinks from the Guardian newspaper website to Get Out of Debt Free. The traffic went through the roof. We went from page four or five on Google for most of the search terms to page one overnight. I remember you can, you know, you can, uh, you can hide a dead body on page two of Google. Uh, and so, and within a few weeks, we were number one on Google, where we've remained ever since. So, and we've got, it is, 
the, the latest incarnation of the website looks very, very slick, a little bit too slick for some people, but we are now a mainstream. We are now in the mainstream, so it's looking like a mainstream website, and so it's looking professional and tidy. And I'm not suggesting anyone actually do this, uh, but we spotted, somebody spotted this on Brighton Seafront uh, in chalk. Uh, <laughs> and can anyone see? I don't, yeah, I don't, it's, not very, it's not a very bright picture, but it's getoutofdebtfree.org yeah, across the seawall. So, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. So, yeah, and I just feel fortunate to be part of this movement and be able to share this with so many people. None of the original work was my own. I don't take any credit for it. It was Mary Elizabeth Croft. Didn't get the template letters up. She's been in contact uh, with me uh, in the last sort of year or so and actually said thank you for uh, getting a load of traffic to her website. And I had the opportunity of thanking her for her amazing work. But as George Carling says, just because you've got the monkey off your back doesn't mean the circus has left town. Okay, which is like, yeah. So I don't have any debt problems because I no longer have... Uh, personal debt. Uh, I'm supposed to actually have my own share of the national debt, which is up to about five trillion, which if you actually printed that in 50 pound notes and put it on pallets, uh, it would actually five trillion. I, I know one trillion uh, in 50 pound notes would cover a football pitch and a half with the pallets stacked one on top of the other. So we're talking figures here, which are absolutely ridiculous. So, excuse me. What's the problem with money? Well, you know, uh, yesterday we had uh, Justin, and he, he explained a lot of the problems with it. But the wonderful thing is the bankers themselves don't keep it a secret. Because what I'll often do is ask, anyone here ever had a loan? Yeah, all hands got... And I go, no, you haven't. You've never had a loan in your life. There isn't, and they haven't got money. You know, we, we get this idea. We're told at an early age that what you do, you put your savings in a bank, and the bank lend your savings, and that's absolute rubbish. What's happening is every time you get a credit card, a loan, or a mortgage, they're creating brand new money. And if you don't believe me, uh, you know... Uh, well, I've got some quotes coming up in a second. But just like Monopoly, I say it's worthless paper. Only 3% is actually in notes and paper and you know, effectively debt-free, although it's got nothing backing it. So just like Monopoly money, it's completely worthless. And then uh, if they want, you know, if you want a million pounds, if a bank needs a million pounds, all it does on a keyboard, tap, 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 a million pounds. There it is. You know, simple. So, if you don't believe me, here we've got Mervyn King, governor of, well, ex-governor of the Bank of England now, and he said when banks extend loans to their customers, they create money by crediting the customers' accounts. He's actually saying they create money, and he's not the only one. Here we go, uh, Ralph Hawtrey, former Secretary of the British Secre uh, Treasury. Banks lend by creating credit. They create the means of payment out of nothing. I mean, it, it's, there's loads of them. There's loads of them. So uh, I'm not the only one. And there we've got, I mean, this one, uh, this is a uh, Lord Adair Turner. The financial crisis of 2007, 2008 occurred because we failed to constrain the private financial system's creation of private credit and money. So you would think they'd have learnt something by now and, and put something in place to stop it happening. But of course, when, uh, you know, when Justin actually contacts the, uh, you know, the Treasury uh, Committee looking after sort of finance, they're not interested in solving the problems because basically the banking system is running the government. People say, is the Bank of England, you know, does the government own the Bank of England? And I say, no, the Bank of England owns the government. Seriously, seriously. And I, I remember, re, you know, when I read Nexus magazine, you know, the, the actual article was about five pages long and it went into a huge amount of detail. 
But all I remembered about the Federal Reserve is it's not federal and there's no reserves. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's all you need. That's all you need. I mean, it's, we laugh about it, but it, it is laughable. It's completely laughable. And, you know, we are entirely dependent on banks' actions because they create and distribute 97% of the money supply. And who gets the money and for what, you know, for what purpose basically comes down to the bank. And, you know, our current form of capitalis capitalism has no concept of right and wrong. It only recognises what is profitable and what you can get away with. And, uh, and when you have the government, media, military and police on your payroll, you can get away with pretty well anything. And they do. And we saw that, you know, in yesterday's testimony, uh, testimony and uh, we're going to see more today. And so we produce more than enough food to eradicate world hunger. Too bad there's not enough money to pay for it. And so I honestly believe that the monetary system is the root of all the problems on the planet. I really do. And this is why I think, you know, when, when you get your MPs, engage them. Say, you know, why are we having austerity? Because they all agree with austerity. We should be living in an era of abundance. You know, we, we should, you know, just be able to work for one or two days a week doing something that's important, that's important to us, and we'd have enough to feed ev and clothe and for everyone on the planet to have an amazing life. But we're going to get there. And Thomas Jefferson actually said, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that grow up around them will deprive the people of all their property until the children will wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. And that is now happening. In America, you've got huge tented cities where you've got huge amounts of people. You don't see this on the news. You expect everyone to have a big house and a car. It's not like that. There's an awful lot of people, and in this country as well. Homeless, not because they, you know, they've got a sort of substance misuse problems, but homeless because they've had their houses and uh, accommodation stolen from them. And, and this is the problem when you have a monetary supply. It's all down to the marbles. And so when you're, everyone's chasing for that extra marble the whole time, what they have to do is, with two things that's going to happen. One, governments, individuals, and companies are going to default. They have to. That's part of the system. So it's built in. The banks know when they create this money out of nothing that every sort of tenth homeowner is going to lose their house. And that's, that, that's hundreds of thousands of people that will never be able to pay their mortgage off because the money doesn't exist. And you only have to look at the uh, Bank of England balance sheet. Uh, the little wobble there was 2007, 2008. And the spike is how much the actual money supply has grown in this country since then. There's hardly even a wobble for the, for the last war. And then you've got economist Keith Boulding. Anyone who believes, an exponential, believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> and of course, he was an economist. You know, it's, uh, it, is, it is funny. It's laughable. But you can say this to your... You know, go to your MP and say this and, and just try and get simple messages. That's what they do to us. You know, if you can't explain it to a 10-year-old, you can't explain it to an MP. So keep it simple. So it's not a crisis. It's a scam. You know, it's designed like this. It's designed to take wealth from the poorest, most vulnerable people in this country or on the planet and give it to the most powerful and the richest. And it's working quite well at doing that. But... And money was never intended to be a commodity, but as a means of accounting for our labor. Okay, so it was never designed. It, it's a way that what's happening is when we're working for each other, and so I do a job for you, the government takes a big cut of it. 
And it's taking most people are losing about 50% of their income in various taxes. So it's almost like they're turning at us into slaves. But things are changing. And it's a mathematical certainty that the economy will collapse. I hate that to break that to you. And people start going, well, what are we going to do? I think that's going to give us a fantastic opportunity to actually have a debt-free currency that is transparent and created by the government. And that will make our lives infinitely more enjoyable and more abundant. And, you know, you've got George Soros here. He's actually selling his shares in Citigroup at the moment uh, and J.P. Morgan. Uh, so, so is there a, you know, why is it you've actually got people pulling out of the banking system, especially when they're people like that that know what's going on? And then we've got, this was, uh, I think, when was this? This was last month. Why the next stock market crash will happen any day now? Well, it's been up and down. It's not crashed yet but it's been up and down quite widely. It then last week, it peaked because they had some good news about Greece. But the thing is, they can say they're gonna, like, Greece is going to pay, pay off their debts, but if you're bankrupt, you can't. You physically can't. I mean, if, if anyone's actually been in a situation where you're in a huge amount of debt, borrowing more money isn't the way out, is it? It can't be. It's crazy. And 10 warning signs uh, of a market crash in 2015. I think the next crash won't just be like 2007, 2008, which was like a bit of a blip. But we're, we're looking at the, the whole, you know, there's already signs that the dollar's going to, uh, you know, the wheels are going to fall off. And when it does, it's going to be interesting. But I am very, very optimistic, I must admit. So, yeah, it happens slowly at first, then all at once. Everything feels normal and then suddenly it's not. So where are we on that graph? Any, any ideas? <laughs> but, just like Monopoly, at the end of the game, it's all got to go back in the box, hasn't it? And even the IMF have actually worked out they could get rid of debt just like that. Because they can, you know, any political party could basically... In fact, I was going to do a video where I get on to the Treasury and just confirm exactly what the actual national debt is at the moment. And, uh, and then, of course, because on Get Out of Debt Free, we've got uh, promissory notes that you can download. And, in fact, you've, got a, you've all got a pen and paper on the desk. You can all create your own promissory notes. You could, any one of us here can actually pay off the national debt with a promissory note. It's that simple. Because if they can do it, we can do it. In fact, they're corporate fictions. They're not even real. So, you know, and of course, you know, I've got to mention uh, my uh, buddy Justin, who's... Uh, I, I don't need to go over this slide too much. Uh, but I came from Guernsey, and in Guernsey, we had the same thing in the Napoleon, after the Napoleonic War. Basically, the island was bankrupt. They created their own money, and it turned the island around. It built a new harbor. It built a seawall. It built buildings for the public, and it literally made the island prosperous. And we're still living with that prosperity to this day, except they turned it into a, a tax haven. <laughs> So, and something else which is exciting, and, and this weekend has been amazing, and I just feel privileged to actually be involved with it, but the, the, everything is speeding up. And the reason why my talk's been called Straw Man, Nature of the Cage, is that a mate of mine, uh, John Webster, who's a professional filmmaker, uh, he's actually got studios in Elstree, he's actually created this film. I don't think there's anyone else on the planet that could have made this film, because, A, he's a, you know, he's a professional filmmaker. He did uh, Resonance, Beings of Frequency. Did anyone see that? Yeah, a few of you. Brilliant film, documentary film, about uh, the connection between mobile phones and the population of bees. And 
It was brilliantly researched. He has researched everything in this documentary about money, about law, and he believes that the documentary would stand up in a court of law. So it's very powerful. I'm going to play it at the end, so I'm just going to go to the end of my slides. The most important thing I say is respect authority. Does anyone agree with that? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I will explain. There is, only, there is only one authority in your life, and it doesn't come from outside. And the reason why, when we started, I just wanted us to take deep breaths is because when you quiet your mind, when you turn the television off, or go for a walk on the beach, or walk the dog, whatever you do, when you go into that sort of peaceful place where you're, you're not up here worrying, you go into your heart, that's where your authority is. And every major decision I've made in my life has actually, in the last few years, it never used to be, but in the last few years, the reason why I've had the opportunity to come to things like this is because I'm working more from my heart than I am from my head. So that's the only authority. Don't look outside for authority because that's where you get caught up. And the people that think authority is somebody with uh, a gun or a taser or something like that, that's not authority. Authority comes from within. And we're seeing that when people stand in their power, that's how we're going to actually overcome this fraudulent system because we are in alignment with the truth. And it's very powerful. <clears throat> I believe in the months to come, our world is going to change beyond recognition. Our true history will be revealed along with the truth of the system we've been living under. Much technology has been withheld from us and will be released, including power production, health and transport. War, disease and pollution will be a thing of the past. And the person that says it cannot be done shouldn't interrupt those people doing it. <laughs> that wasn't mine. That was like, yeah. And I think we realise that this weekend, the time is now. We're going through a shift in consciousness that the planet has never seen before. And it's wonderful to be here with everyone on the cutting edge of that shift. And there will be challenges. The powers that, may, you know, the powers that were <laughs> may be powerful with their media, money, and armed thugs, but we are infinitely more powerful, and it's time to step into that power now. And Richard Bach said, what the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls the butterfly. And if I can just finish with a quick poem, words from the Hopi people. We've been telling people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people this is the hour. To my fellow swimmers, there is a river flowing very fast. It is so swift there will be those who will be afraid and they will try and hold on to the shore and they will feel they are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has a destination. The elders say, we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, and I say, see who, see who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves together as we are today, Banish the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration, for we are the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you. And I'm just going to finish by... We've just got a quick trailer for Nature of the Cage. If we've got time for that. Yeah, we do. Thank you. Work out how to play it. 
lost my cursor. Don't know if we've got any sound on the. Uh... So, if you see your name with the title yeah. of Mr. or Mrs. or they use our name in uppercase, this is back to Admiralty Law. So, legal fiction is an abstract term to explain a concept, and so is the term straw man. With debt collectors, um, people assume when a debt collector comes around that they have actual power. They don't, they have no power whatsoever. They only have the power that you give to them. 90% of the crime, or 99% of the crime they perceive that is crime, is actually called victimless crime. There is no victims. And crime can only exist if there is a victim. You know, we've seen police officers more interested in becoming debt collectors and enforcing policies, you know, such as speeding tickets and, and fines and things like that, because they're easy targets. Once you comprehend the difference between lawful and legal, and ultimately what your legal fiction um, straw man is, the fear of debt collectors, police and authority just goes away. Here we are uh, in this country, the home of most Western law really, um, in terms of what's executed in America and things like that, its roots are in British law. So you've literally got uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of laws which every day you know, we could be breaking without knowing. We think we're free. We think we've got free choice. If you get, if you get um, the average man or woman walking the street and you say to them, the law says this, you must do this, they will do it. They will just comply. We're enforcing policies, uh, acts and statutes, which when looked into are not actually necessarily lawful. Uh, lawful is according to the law, and the law is, um, don't cause injury, harm or loss to uh, people or their property. Legal um, pertains to um, our legal system and where statutes and acts come from. And it's a system that doesn't actually relate to common law. Uh, Black's Law Dictionary states that a statute is a legislative rule of a society given the force of law by those who consent. One of the precepts that they work on is um, a legal maxim, which is, let he who be deceived, be deceived. Funny enough, you look at the bottom of the birth certificates, most of it say, warning, this is not a means of identification. So it's actually telling you it has nothing to do with you whatsoever. It's just a legal mechanism to maintain that they know what slave they're dealing with at that point of time, because you're a thing to them, you're an inferior. And that is pretty much their attitude. You have to have a system that no one understands in order to enslave people. The courts and uh, the, the police and the, the government are all corporations and they're working together against us. What's happened for us in this country is that now public is considered governance, private is business and the people are nothing. They don't exist, they have no power or meaning. They are the ones to be bullied and trodden upon because they're just the little businesses. It's, you realise that the whole thing is a charade and it's like smoke and mirrors. It's, it, you, can, you can see the whole, the whole trick now, you know, the whole... Uh, is it, when, 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 you, when you have that aha moment, it's like <laughs> staggering, you know? Right, and that should be out, or it's going to go out free on YouTube, and it should be out uh, in the next month or so. So he's on the last edit, so look out for it, and it's going to be something It's amazing that uh, we can share with people. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, John. That was an amazing talk, and I love the trailer.